we're going to be talking about enzymes, and in order to talk about enzymes, we really kind of have to take a quick look back on energy. And so your book talks about some different terminology that I just want to give a little primer of so that you can really understand what you're getting into. So it talks about free energy, and that kind of sounds like an oxymoron, but free energy is basically part of a system's energy. So the overall system has little parts, and this is the part that is available to actually do something, to perform some kind of work. Okay. Now, if you have delta G, remember that delta means change. Okay. So delta G is your change in free energy. Therefore, G is your free energy. Right. Now, any exergonic reactions are going to release energy. And these are generally going to be considered spontaneous because your delta G is less than zero. Okay, so your delta G is less than zero. So if we look at delta G, delta G is just a change in G, so it'll be G final minus G initial. And this should look like some kind of a basic physics equation or maybe some kind of a math equation that you've seen. Okay, so delta G is G final minus G initial. So if delta G is going to be less than zero, that means it has to be a negative value, okay? So in order for this equation to be negative, this value, GI, has to be bigger than G final, okay? So you are going from a larger initial G to a smaller final G. Okay. So that's why it's spontaneous. Okay. Endergonic reactions are the exact opposite. Instead of energy being released when this happens, you have to put energy in for this to happen. This is going to absorb some of your energy. And basically this just means that delta G is greater than zero. I know this is all kind of vague, but it will make sense as I start to show you more examples. But just to kind of give you a visual, here is a really simple graph showing the reactants and the products of a given reaction. So along the y-axis here, I have free energy, and along the x-axis, I have the reaction you know, time elapsed or just progress of the reaction. Okay? So I start out with my reactants. That's the thing that I start with. And you'll notice that they have relatively high free energy. It goes up to this dashed line. Okay? Pretty high. My products, however, have a lower free energy. It goes down to this bottom dashed line. So I went from high energy reactants to low energy products, and we know that energy can't be created or destroyed, so it had to go somewhere. Okay? And so that right here, this difference in energy, so the initial and the final, right? we compare them, that difference is going to be released in some way. Okay? So that's what's happening here. We have energy leaving. Okay, because energy doesn't just disappear, it's really kind of part of the products. But here we're looking at the actual molecules and the actual molecules. Okay, so we have some energy released. And you guys have seen this, it's just trying to provide a more mathematical explanation for it. An endergonic reaction is going to be the exact opposite. Instead of energy being released, like it was here in the exergonic reaction, which is a lot like an exothermic reaction, right, from chemistry, here, kind of like an endothermic reaction, you have to put some energy in. Okay, It's not spontaneous. It's not going to do it by itself. You have to do it. You have to make it happen. Okay, So here I have reactants that are low in energy and products that are high in energy. In order to make up that difference, I have to add something in. How do I make up this huge difference? Oh, I'm going to add some energy into the system. Okay, So this doesn't happen naturally. I have to make it happen. Okay. And the cell will do three main kinds of work. Remember, work is just really anything that you're actually physically doing. So it will do some mechanical work, and we'll talk about that. It will transport things, so that's what we talked about in Chapter 7, transporting ions, maybe against their concentration gradients. And it will also do some chemical work, so actually changing chemicals through chemical reactions. Okay. Now, it's going to do this through what we call energy coupling. An energy coupling is going to be using an exergonic process, so using one of these to fuel one of these. 
Okay, so here energy was released, and the cell will basically use that energy to make something else happen. So if you kind of think about this energy as being the same as this energy, because they're grouped together, this one will happen first, and then that will create energy that will be used to allow this to happen. And that's going to happen again and again and again in the metabolism of organisms and cells. Okay. So, with that, we can kind of start talking about enzymes, okay? So, enzymes can be very complex, and in order to show that, here's just a simple little enzyme, but you'll notice that even the simple enzymes have multiple parts that we care about, okay? We have things called cofactors, we have coenzymes, we have catalytic sites, okay? These are going to be things that you just need to familiarize yourself. I would recommend some flashcards. And we're going to practice in class with some cut-up pool noodles, and it will all make a lot more sense as we do that. But, again, just as a primer here, what I want you to start thinking of is, remember, these are proteins. And if you remember from Chapter 5, proteins are really complex, and they're really large molecules generally. And if you mess with them, like if you change their shape, they're not going to be able to do their function. Okay, so I want you to start thinking about how if you mess up a protein in any way, you might mess up its ability to do its job properly. Okay, and that's concerning for an organism. And so I'm going to show you some examples of that. But here we have an enzyme. Okay, that's the yellow part right here. Here's a really simple diagram of an enzyme. Okay, now enzymes are going to speed up chemical reactions. They're going to make them faster and they're going to make them more likely to happen. They do that by having an area on the enzyme called the active site. Okay, so it's just like this big old hole here. And that active site is where things can bind. Specifically, it's where the substrate can bind. Unfortunately, you just have to get used to that terminology of substrate and active site. Okay, so the substrate will bind on to the active site. And when it does that, it kind of becomes one large thing, right? You can see that it kind of makes it whole, if you will. Now, it's not actually going to be an oval shape, right? It's actually much more complex than that, but this is a nice visual, okay? It's like the missing piece, okay? When they're combined, we call that the enzyme substrate complex, but you really don't need to memorize that, okay? It's really just combining the enzyme and the substrate, okay? Now, this whole process is basically how an enzyme works. Something binds and then the enzyme does something and now it's working and doing whatever it's supposed to do. So you're going to see that again and again. But the question kind of gets begged, what's the point? Why do we make these enzymes? Okay, so enzymes make reactions more likely to happen and they happen faster. Okay, so enzymes catalyze reaction. Remember from chemistry what a catalyst is. Okay, it allows a reaction to happen more easily. And it lowers the activation energy. Okay, so the activation energy is basically the energy point that the reaction has to hit in order for things to happen. Okay, so here in the blue dashed line, I have what the activation energy would be without any enzymes. So in order for this to happen without enzymes, I have to get my energy way up here. That's huge. That takes so much energy. However, if I have the proper enzyme, I only have to get it up to this magenta line. Okay, I only have to get it up here. And if I can get it up to this level of energy, it's going to happen. So I just it's way more efficient to use enzymes. Okay, That's all you really need to understand for now, because they won't happen spontaneously because the activation energy is too high. Okay? So the enzymes active sites can be simple or they can be complex. So I'm going to start simple and kind of move to more complex. Okay, so here we have an active site of an enzyme. You can see that the substrate physically meets and connects with that uh, active site, right? Now this is the same in real life except instead of being these simplified 2D models, these are 3D molecules, right? So just understand that this is a simplification. And in this situation, after it has bound, after the substrate has bound, we now have some weakening of the bonds in the substrate. So something that the enzyme did has caused 
this to be less stable, and that causes it to separate. Okay? So basically the enzyme took one thing and broke it up into two things. Okay? So this, the enzyme basically took A and turned it into B plus C. If this is A, and this is B, and this is C. Now this wouldn't have happened without the enzyme, because A is pretty happy. It's pretty content being like this. But something happened over here that broke those bonds or weakened those bonds and that allowed B and C to separate. Okay? So this is one way that an enzyme will work. It's kind of easiest to think about enzymes because they're so complex as really simple either analogies or diagrams like we've seen. So here's a nice little analogy. Okay, the enzyme is a lock. Now locks have specific places that you can insert a key. You can't just put the key over here and hope that it will unlock the lock. That's not how it works. Okay? Enzymes are the same way. They have to go in their proper place. Otherwise, they're not going to do their thing. So in this case, this guy right here, our keyhole is actually our active site. Okay? That's the only place that the substrate, which in this case is our key, can bind in order for it to do its thing properly. Okay? Now when they're combined, they're going to be a lock key complex, just like we have an enzyme substrate complex. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Here's just another simplified diagram showing an enzyme doing its thing. So this green combined thing, substrate comes in, binds to the active site, and then it's going to slightly change in some way because of the enzyme. And now the enzyme or the substrate, excuse me, has kind of broken into two parts, and then they can leave separately. So this once again is going to be an A turning into a B and a C. Okay? This is just the enzyme breaking up one thing into two products. Okay? But now we're going to get a little more complex. So here's two terms that you need to know. We have cofactors and coenzymes. Okay, so cofactors are going to be any inorganic chemicals, just think of it as any chemical, that helps enzymes do their thing. Okay? And coenzymes, so remember co means together, coenzymes are going to be small organic non-proteins. Okay? And it's really the same idea. They're both going to help the enzyme to do its thing. Okay? In order for a substrate, so here's a substrate, to bind to an active site, so here's an active site, the cofactor or the coenzyme has to be there first. Okay? So if you look here, this red guy would not be able to fit here. Okay? Because it would just it wouldn't attach on one side and so it would just float away. Okay? But if I put in the cofactor or the coenzyme, that's right here, here's my co, whatever that co is, doesn't matter which, okay? It's going to bind first, and now there's a nice little cozy spot for my actual substrate to bind. So sometimes you need something to come along and make the active site accessible. Okay. And so an enzyme will only be active when the cell wants it to be. So this kind of allows the cell to regulate when the enzyme is active. Okay. So we can have this thing floating around all we want, and it's not breaking stuff up until we want it to, because then we'll release the coenzyme or the cofactor. Okay? And now that I have this released, now it's going to bind, because it likes that spot, it's nice and cozy, and that means that it can break down whatever this red thing is. Okay? So this is just all about regulation. So, <clears throat> excuse me, just remember from chapter 5 that enzymes are proteins, and proteins have specific factors that need to be just right in order for them to do their job. Okay, so factors that might be important for an enzyme could be temperature, pH, those are going to be the most common ones that we talk about, substrate concentration, so how much of that red lump here is there. If there's a lot of it, then it's going to bind more often, right? If there's not much, it's going to be pretty rare. Okay, inhibitors which we haven't quite gotten to, and I'm going to talk about that. But inhibitors basically stop enzymes from doing their job. So it's kind of the opposite of a cofactor. 
Okay, so if a cofactor is responsible for letting an enzyme do its job, an inhibitor is going to be like a big old red X that says, uh-uh, we're not doing this right now. Okay. Now, you can see enzyme activity based on these factors. So here I have two graphs, one of temperature on the x-axis and one of pH on the x-axis. And along the y-axis of both, I have enzyme activity. So the higher you are, the more the enzymes are doing their thing. Okay, so this is the point, this is the best enzyme activity for this range. Okay, so right around 35, 36 degrees Celsius. Okay, if I go all the way down. That's going to be where this enzyme, its optimum temperature is. Okay, over here, I have an optimum pH. Okay, maybe a little over 7. Okay, so there, if I stray from that, if I go too low, too acidic, then notice that my enzyme activity drops off. It gets worse. If I go too basic, it drops off. Same with the temperature. If I go too hot, it drops off. And if I go too low, it drops off. Now, sometimes these are going to be symmetrical. Sometimes being cold is just as bad as being warm, too warm. But you can notice in this case up here, it's actually kind of worse to be too warm. Okay, it drops off really quickly. It's a really steep slope, whereas this is a more gradual slope. And there's reasons for that that we're going to get to right now. So here I have a normal protein. It's doing its thing. And over here I have a denatured protein. So this is like a callback to chapter 5. So this protein can't do its thing because it's not folded properly. Okay? The reason it's not folded properly is because I messed up some of the environmental conditions. Maybe it got too hot. Okay? This is more likely to happen when it gets too hot than it is to when it gets too cold. Okay. Because remember, all of these folds are due to like hydrogen bonds and other generally pretty weak bonds. Sometimes they're ionic, sometimes there's a disulfide bridge. Remember all that from chapter 5? So if I introduce more heat, a higher temperature to an area, those hydrogen bonds aren't going to be very strong. right? They're going to break pretty easily and you're going to get a denatured protein. So this is the exact reason why a really high fever can kill you. So if you have a really high fever, that means your core body temperature has gotten too high, and that's going to cause a lot of your proteins that are critical to your life to denature and become this, you know, floppy mess instead of doing what they're supposed to do. And then you can't function properly and you can die. Okay? So just remember that there's an optimum. There's an optimum temperature. There's an optimum pH. Each enzyme is unique. It has its own optimum stuff. Sometimes enzymes won't really be at their best. And that's okay as long as they're functioning, fun, excuse me, functioning enough. Okay? <clears throat> excuse me. The reason it gets slower as you're colder is because things move less quickly, and so they're less likely to come into contact with an enzyme. Okay? So here I have three different bacteria. Okay, so these are all different species of bacteria, and this is a measure of their enzyme reactions, basically, because we're measuring what they're putting out from the enzymes over here. And you'll notice that they have different optimums. So for the C. cellulolyticum, that's, that temperature optimum is right around 60 degrees Celsius, whereas for the T. fusca, or fusca, however you say it, who cares, is around 70 degrees Celsius. And then the C thermocellum is even higher, around 80 degrees Celsius. So different things like different things. Okay. Now this is the same thing for the pH. I'm going to skip over this because we know this. But just to kind of solidify it, your stomach has a really high pH, or excuse me, a really low pH, really high acidity, right? And so the, the enzymes that are in your stomach like stomach protease, have to be good in those conditions. Okay, so just realize that different enzymes will have different optimums depending on where they are and what they do. Okay, now substrate concentration is something that I mentioned before. Remember, this is how much of that substrate there is. So in this case, I have the enzyme being these large, almost Pac-Man-esque little shapes here. And the substrate is this little pink thing. Okay, so over on the left side, I have a low substrate concentration. You can tell because there's not many of these pink guys. But then as I go over here, I have a high substrate concentration. 
So if I only have two substrates for this whole area, they're not going to bind very often, right? So the reaction is going to be pretty slow. But if I have a high concentration, I have lots of pink things, they're going to be binding to these enzymes all the time. And so the speed of the reaction, the rate of the reaction, will be much higher. And so we can actually graph that as well. So we have substrate concentration along the x-axis, it's our independent variable, and the rate of reaction is our dependent variable. And if we have zero substrates, then we're going to have no reaction, because there's nothing to react with, right? That makes sense. Then if I increase the amount of pink stuff, so I'm going to the right on the x-axis, I'm going to increase the rate of reaction because there's more of it, so it's going to happen more. However, at a certain point, increasing the concentration just won't affect it anymore, because you only have so many enzymes, okay? I only have five enzymes, so they can only really have five bound at any given time. So we just call that the point of saturation. It's basically when this thing flatlines. It's when adding more of the reactant, or the substrate rather, doesn't really matter anymore. So we see a flat line in the rate of reaction. So, bringing it back to inhibitors. So these are the things that are kind of opposites of coenzymes and cofactors. They stop things from happening. Okay, there are two types of inhibitor. We have a competitive inhibitor and a non-competitive inhibitor. And those are named there because they make sense in context. So I don't really want you to memorize it so much as I want you to understand it. Okay? And that's really the case for any vocab in bio, but they're called this for a reason. Okay? So here I have a nice visual for a competitive inhibitor. Okay? So it's drawn this way for a very particular reason. So here I have an enzyme, and here I have a substrate, and my enzyme, it's not labeled yet, but it has an active site. Remember, the active site is where all the magic happens. Okay, here's the active site. So, where does the substrate want to bind? It wants to bind at the active site. Okay. But, I have something here. I have a competitive inhibitor. And the competitive inhibitor is called that because it will actually compete with the substrate for this spot. This is the front row seat of the concert, and both of these guys want it. Okay. And if the competitive inhibitor's there, the substrate can't fit, there's only one seat. Okay, so that's what's happening over here. I have something else bound at the active site, and so my substrate can't do its thing, so it's just gonna move away. Okay, so these are a way to regulate our enzyme activity. So if, for instance, I don't wanna break this down right now, excuse me, break this down right now, then I'm gonna have a lot of these competitive inhibitors to help prevent that from happening, okay? So sometimes this is permanent. You can stop this enzyme from ever working again, or it's often reversible. It'll just bind here for a little while and then it'll go away. Okay. So that's going to decrease the rate of the reaction. Okay. So on the y-axis here, we have the rate of the reaction. It's just represented by V, excuse me. So V max is our fastest rate of reaction. And you can see here that when you have a competitive inhibitor, it's lower. So this is this black line is normal. This is our comparison. Okay. When you introduce competitors, you start to get a lower rate of reaction. Okay. It's still fairly high though. So the next thing we want to talk about is that really low line, the non-competitive inhibitor. So non-competitive inhibitors will do the same thing. They will stop an enzyme from doing its job, but they're going to do it not by competing for the active site. They have their own special seat at the concert. Okay? So if in this situation I have this guy, okay, this is my substrate, okay, substrate, and it has an active site. Okay? Here's my active site for this. The inhibitor doesn't want to fit here. It may look like it'll fit, but it's way too small. So actually, it's going to fit right here. And that's going to cause this whole enzyme to change shape so much that this guy can no longer fit. Okay, so it's the same thing. It stops the enzyme from working. It inhibits enzyme activity. That means it stops it. Okay, and this enzyme no longer works if it is bound like this. 
okay? Because this won't fit anymore. But notice that the active site is still open, it's just not going to be able to bind. So the inhibitor in this case had a different place. Okay, we call that the allosteric. Allo means different. So it's a different place. Allosteric site as opposed to the active site. Okay, it's the same as idea as what's going on over here, except instead of it being in the same spot, it has its own special spot somewhere else. Now, as I said, this will also decrease the rate of our reaction, and you'll notice that in general, that's actually going to increase your rate of reaction a lot more. So now my max uh, rate of reaction with non-competitive inhibitors is about half that that it was without any inhibitors. So it's a much lower line overall. And that's gonna about do it for enzyme basics, but if you're still struggling, here are some links to a Bozeman video. I highly recommend Bozeman. He's great. And there's also some other videos that will kind of break down competitive and non-competitive inhibition more clearly if that distinction is messing up. Just understand what inhibition is. Hey, it's when something is stopping an enzyme from doing its job. And then just know that there are two types. Sometimes that thing that is stopping it will compete for an active site and sometimes it has its own special place at the concert. But that's going to do it for this recording and next time we're going to be talking about cellular respiration.